Hello and welcome back to Sig Mechanics. I'm Edmund. Today's video is going to be on the P320's striker safety and its disengagement parameters. I would like to explore what it takes in terms of movement, distance, and general requirement for the striker safety on the P320 to disengage under normal operation. And as per Sig Mechanics standard practice, this video is not going to be about my personal opinion on the design or function. I will simply only be providing you the raw results based on testing or what we can physically see. So in this video, I'm going to explore a couple of things. The first and second are going to be quick primers on how the FCU's safety lever interacts with the striker's safety lever and the mechanical operation of the striker safety. And then I'm going to be using some precision instruments to measure the striker safety lever's movement to see how much vertical distance it needs to move in order to disengage. And then I wanna see how that result translates to trigger travel distance. So we can see how far back I have to pull the trigger in order to achieve said disengagement. And last, I want to look at any remaining distance the trigger will travel to actually fire the pistol after the point of safety disengagement. Let's begin. As always, a quick disclaimer here. I'm not a gunsmith or a certified armorer, and making any modifications to your pistol or manipulating the components can result in catastrophic failure, possibly injury or worse. So if you're not sure about what you're doing, I strongly advise you see a professional to either do the work for you or provide you an extra level of guidance as you proceed. We'll begin by quickly familiarizing ourselves with the FCU's safety lever and the striker's safety lever. And by the way, because I assume I'll be using the words safety lever quite a bit over the course of this video, I will preface the word safety lever with either FCU or striker so you know which one I'm talking about or maybe I'll reference the FCU safety lever as a lifter, uh, just to differentiate between the two. Anyways, the FCU safety lever moves up when the operator pulls the trigger and moves down when the operator releases the trigger. Let's take a quick look at why this works. The design of the FCU's safety lever is as such that it has these two protruding tabs that make contact with the front and back of the trigger bar here and here. So when the trigger bar is installed, the leg that sticks out of the rear of the trigger bar here is caught in between the two tabs. And this makes it so that the FCU safety lever will rotate a consistent amount relative to the gun's trigger travel. So as you can see here, when the, uh, when the trigger is pulled, the trigger bar leg contacts the front tab and the lifter will rise up. And thanks to the trigger bar spring, when the trigger bar moves backwards, uh, towards rest, it will contact the rear tab and the lifter will fall back down. Additionally, the striker's safety lever system is pretty simple. The lever pivots up and down and it's tensioned by this spring on the side of the striker's housing. Now, when the gun is in battery, the striker safety lever sits just above the FCU safety lever lifter. And when the operator pulls the trigger, the lifter will rise up and make contact with the striker's safety lever to push it up. Okay, so that was a quick introduction as uh, to how the FCU and striker interact when they're together. So how does the safety mechanism on the striker work? Here, I'll introduce a few key things about the striker to keep in mind as we progress. The striker safety lever itself is a simple stamped steel part and it has this small tab bent on the front end and this rounded tab on the back end and it sits within this recessed area here uh, machined into the housing. And when the lever is inserted into the housing, that rounded back tab forms a pivot point and the bent tab at the front sits into and it slightly penetrates the housing. And if we actually look through the back of the housing, we can see the leg moving up and down when I manually manipulate the lever. The spring associated with the safety lever sits with the short leg housed within this little recess uh, space above, and the long leg angled down and makes contact with the safety lever's midpoint. The spring's job is to continuously force the safety lever down. On the striker, 
the body has this sort of shelf machined into it that makes up most of the right hand side and if you look at the rear end of the shelf you'll notice this vertical rise or this step that's machined along that plane the key striker safety mechanisms are here the bent tab that penetrates into the housing and here the vertical step that's machined onto the shelf and that tab stamped on the safety lever basically forms a physical barrier that prevents the striker from entering the breech face when the sear releases it, but only if the trigger is not being pulled. Keep in mind, Sig Sauer doesn't market this as a manual safety to prevent trigger pull. Instead, it's marketed as a way to prevent firing should the sear or striker itself malfunction. When I showcase it to you like this, the safety lever's leg and step machined into the striker here are in contact with one another. And this causes additional friction and increased weight required by me to move the striker safety lever up when I push on it. Not to mention that this lacks any real tension on the striker spring since the spring in normal operation looks more like this. Let's see that same spring tension in a real life setup. Here, you would have to reset the striker by racking the slide, which will then cause the striker's hook to catch the sear's ledge. And this moves that vertical step that we talked about on the striker's body all the way back so it no longer touches the safety lever's bent tab. And at that point, there's this gap between the step and the tab, and consequently, this likely makes for a smoother trigger pull since there's less friction and weight required by the operator when they move the FCU safety lever up during trigger travel. But as I explained, the striker safety lever is not there to stop you from firing. Let's simulate some sort of unnatural force moving the sear without touching the trigger. And by the way, everything on the setup you see here is as it normally would be, except I removed the reset spring that hides inside the striker's housing, uh, mainly because I want the striker's head to stick out of the breech face after I fire. And I do this um, because if I don't, the, uh, the striker is going to move too fast and you're not going to be able to see uh, the result. So uh, let's test fire by manipulating the sear only and not the trigger. Now we can see in the front, no striker. Let's do it again with the trigger pulled this time. And now you can see the striker's head protruding out of the breech face. Anyways, let's move on. Okay, so let's get into the measurements. I'll start by quickly showing you a few modifications that I made for this test. And for the purposes of this demonstration, the main spring that runs along the striker's body will be removed, and I will also be removing the tiny reset spring that's inside the striker's housing, and I'm removing them for two reasons. The first is when I release the striker, I don't want the spring to violently drop and vibrate the setup while I'm trying to read the result on the measurement instrument. And second, I don't want the internal reset spring to cushion the striker's fall. I want the striker to fall as freely as we can make it. And I will, however, be still be keeping the spring that interacts with the striker safety lever itself. I've also stripped the FCU and I've assembled it so that the only component inside the sear housing here is a fully functional FCU safety lever. I should note that I removed the sear and replaced it with this spring here from a 1911, which uh, was the exact diameter needed to coil over the FCU's safety lever pin. And I need this here because without the sear, the FCU safety lever will just shift side to side. Also, um, having the FCU pretty much completely stripped allows for a great visual of the internals. And that being said, I removed the slide cap and then secured the striker assembly with a construction staple to expose the internal mechanism as best I can. My setup is a stripped slide with only the striker assembly installed, just like I described previously, and the slide is on a vise holding it vertically to allow the striker to fall by gravity, and a dial indicator, which if you don't know what this is, it's a tool for um, allowing me to read very precise distances and for it, I've installed this uh, flat end contact point. 
and I also have uh, my digital calipers here. Okay, that's it. So let's measure. Let's get the average reading for the height on the step here. And we'll use my calipers for this. And the uh, we'll do three readings for this and we'll calculate the average. So first reading we get 0 0.0315. Second reading 0 0.032. And last reading 0 0.0365. So um, it looks like it's about 0 0.03233. I'll put the actual average on the screen. Okay, so I want this to be somewhat definitive. So let's see if there's a difference between measuring just the step depth like we did and measuring the actual movement that the safety lever makes when it's installed on the slide. And to do this, here is the striker's safety lever. And when I push it in with my finger manually, the striker just drops down because again, I removed the main spring that's running along the striker's body and the reset spring that is inside the striker's housing. And to get the reading, I'm going to start with the striker dropped and then I'm going to slowly reset the striker with uh, one of my tools here. And if you recall, the spring pushing the striker safety lever is still there forcing the lever down. So once uh, the uh, step on the striker clears the tab, the lever is going to pop up. And uh, I'm going to have the flat contact point pushing on the lever and dialed to zero. And what's going to happen is once the lever pops up, we can get a precise distance that the lever traveled. So, okay, let's uh, set this up and test this. Okay, so the dial indicator is set to zero and we'll get our first test result now. 0 0.036 inches. Let's reset to zero. And we'll get a second reading now. 0 0.036 inches. Let's reset. And we'll do a last reading on this. 0 0.036. Okay, so I can comfortably say the distance that the um, the striker uh, lever moves within the slide is uh, 0 0.036 inches. Uh, now, if uh, you recall, we measured the step here on the striker, and that was 0 0.0 three three inches uh, so there's a difference of three thousands of an inch and i'm actually curious now what the dimensions of the safety lever um, itself is so let's take a reading of the the body here and that is 0 0.035 let's do a reading on the tab as well 0.033. So it's not ex unexpected because when you stamp or bend metal, you're compressing and stretching the material. So um, it very well might be exactly that. So um, you know what? Let's, as a reference uh, on that three thousandths of an inch, let's. So here is a piece of paper, and I'm going to do a quick uh, thickness reading on this. So a piece of paper is exactly three thousandths of an inch. So um, it, there's that's the difference that we've got. So it's pretty insignificant in the grand scheme of things. However, um, there is a difference, and I'll venture a guess as to why. And I'm going to say that chances are it's uh, because the lever uh, pivots um, pivots up, and uh, it doesn't move straight up and down. It, there's it follows a slight curve in its movement. The and the slight difference is probably due to the tiny extra distance that curve has to follow it could also be due to user error and the fact that i couldn't get a consistent reading on the step with calipers definitely does support that um, anyways let's take a look at how the reading we took from the striker lever translates into trigger travel so i installed the barrel the recoil spring and the takedown lever to position the fcu where it is and the height or position of the fcu is important because i want the safety lever of the fcu to line up perfectly with the safety lever on the striker and what this will allow me to do is i can now pull the trigger and this will activate the striker the striker will drop down when the safety lever moves out of the way and then i can with one of my tools just push up and reset the striker to do a follow-up trigger pull and uh, all of this will be positioned so that the top of the dial indicator is uh, connecting with the midpoint on the trigger. And this way I can get a good reading. So let's start.
Okay, we'll pull the trigger and we'll listen for the striker to drop. And when that happens, we'll take a reading of the dial indicator and make a note of the distance it traveled. Okay, I believe that was 0 0.090 inches, but I'll take a look at the video later and uh, post the actual um, reading on the screen here when you're watching it. Let's reset the striker. And set the dial back to zero. Try again. Okay, I think that dropped that point zero nine zero again. Uh, let's reset and we'll do one more. Okay. Last one. Okay, so it seems rather consistent at 0 0.090. So I think we've established that the striker safety disengagement parameters are 0 0.090 inches of trigger travel will equate to 0 0.036 inches of striker lever upwards movement. Uh, however, let, let's reinstall the sear and we'll do a trigger pull. Um, and what we'll do is we'll move the trigger 0 0.090 inches, which we know is the amount required to disengage the safety. And then we'll check out how much the sear has moved at that point, And we can have a visual as to how much movement remains to actually fire the gun after the striker safety lever is disengaged. All right, so we will pull back the trigger 0 0.09 inches and we'll monitor the trigger movement over here. And once we get to 0 0.090 inches, we know the striker safety is off and we will then switch over to the back of the slide to verify visually if the sear moves or is otherwise engaged. We will also see how much further we need the sear to move once the striker safety is off in order to make the gun fire. Okay, so this is 0 0.090 inches of trigger travel and I haven't seen any sear engagement yet. Let's reset this thing. We'll do a total of three trigger pulls and this is 0 0.090 inches again. Last one, we'll pull 0 0.090 inches. Okay, so I haven't seen any movement of the sear once I hit 0 0.09 inches. So let's do this. Let's test out how long it takes from that point forward to actually have the gun discharge. So this is how we're going to quantify the remaining distance that we need to pull the trigger in order to make the gun fire after the striker safety has been disengaged. Now, this measurement might be different from gun to gun depending on your upgrades. However, this is all stock parts, so we'll see what happens. And what I'll do is I'll measure the amount of trigger travel needed to discharge and then subtract 0 0.09 inches from the result and we should have our answer. Let's begin. So here's what we saw today. The total trigger travel from rest to break measured in at about 0 0.201 inches. And the total distance that the safety lever moves before disengaging is 0 0.036 inches. So the trigger has to travel about five and a half times the distance that the striker safety has to travel in order to discharge. However, as we discovered, when this translates to trigger travel alone, the operator has to pull the trigger 0 0.09 inches in order to actually move the striker lever 0 0.036 inches. So that means that once the operator disengages the safety, they will then be required to pull the trigger an additional 0 0.11 inches from that point to discharge. We also saw that pulling the trigger 0 0.09 inches was enough to disengage the striker safety, but was not enough to engage the sear in any way, which means that there is still take up between the disengagement of the striker safety and the trigger bar making contact with the sear. 
And lastly, I should reiterate to viewers that the striker safety lever is indeed a built-in safety mechanism, although it may not be the sort of safety some people think it is or want it to be. The safety seems to only work under two very narrow conditions. Either the sear has to be moved without operator input, or the leg at the back of the striker has to fail. Either it uh, maybe is worn down substantially or the leg breaks off entirely. But these are the only criteria in which this safety is actually active because past this, it looks like this will not do anything for you if you actually pulled the trigger the sufficient distance of 0.201 inches required to discharge. Uh, although that, I guess that can be said about all guns, but uh, Obviously, I'll remind everyone that you should always follow proper firearm safety. Anyway, I think this was an interesting look into the P320 Strikers safety parameters, and I would like to thank the Sig Mechanic subscriber who asked me this question and inspired the making of this video. Although I'm fairly new to YouTube, so I don't know if I can shout them out directly, but thank you nonetheless. And remember that I do read your comments and I'm always happy to further explore your questions. So leave a comment and I might just make a video about it. I also want to thank MD Charlton, who has partnered with Sig Mechanics, allowing me access to some of the parts required in the making of this video. And for those of you who haven't heard of them, these are the guys who Sig Sauer would direct you to for any international work under the exclusive warranty partnership they have with Sig. And last, uh, due to the time, uh, setup, and effort it takes to make these videos, I release one at least every month, sometimes sooner. So I remind you to subscribe to the channel to receive updates when those videos come out. All right, that's all I got for you today. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.